Welcome everybody to Textiles and Tea with Kathy Group and the Handweavers Guild of America. I am so excited to have you here today. Um, <clears throat> as always, we have a wonderful sponsor today, the Georgia Fans of Blazing Shuttles. Um, we'll talk more about those guys later, but thank you guys so much for sponsoring the episode today. We will have questions the last 15 minutes of the program, as always. Please put your questions in the Q&A. We love the chat. Keep those comments coming. But if you have a question in the chat, I may not see it. So it's better if you put it in the Q&A. We have the one, the only, Catherine Weber here today with us. Catherine has been dyeing and weaving professionally since 1980. For the first 30 years of her uh, career, she focused on creating and selling her own finished woven products. Since then, she's focused on teaching techniques developed over the years and dyeing yarn for other fiber artists. When teaching weaving, uh, Catherine's goals are to give students an alternative method, uh, techniques and concepts to approach design, and weaving. Her weaving classes are titled Controlling Creative Chaos. Most who have spent time in workshops with Catherine will agree that that descriptive is, is of the energy in her class. And we're gonna learn more about her teaching and her dying. So uh, thank you so much for being here today, Catherine. We are excited to have you. I am so glad to be here. Thank you. Well, we're gonna start off with our first question, which is what is your favorite tea? Well, I think you know that. <laughs> it's chai. Oh, yay. <laughs> I like it hot. I like it cold. Oh, that's good. Hey, you know, one time I had the guy made it by mistake. It was a frappuccino, a chai Ooh. frappuccino. It was really good. You should try that sometime. <laughs> I'll do that. Next time we're together, you can bring me one. I will do that. I will do that. <laughs> All right. So how did you get started in fibers? I mean, I read a little bit about your history, but how did it all start? You know, I think I'm just like almost every other fiber person I've asked that. And, and many of us love to sew. We started out sewing. We liked fabric for some reason. We just loved, just, just had that love of fabric. And uh, so I, I sewed a lot of my own clothes back in the day. And uh just little by little, I tried a lot of different crafts, you know, pottery and jewelry and stained glass. Uh, but when it came back to fiber, that just felt like I was coming home. You're very So creative. I will say the first class I took was at Warren Wilson, uh, where I went to college, Warren Wilson College in the mountains in North Carolina. But then I graduated from the um, professional weaving class uh, program also here in the mountains. So that was my true beginning in terms of training. That's at Haywood, right? At Haywood, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, again, you mentioned uh, Warren Wilson, but when you were at Warren Wilson, you were studying psychology, correct? I was, I was. All right. And then yet you also worked in a psychiatric setting for a while. So yeah, I was curious, how yeah. did those, how did your education and your work experience, how does that impact on your, your artwork or your teaching? Well, I actually worked in two different psychiatric hospitals. Oh, you did? Well, you know, what, with a little time between. But I, I tell you, I think the thing is, I just, I really enjoy working with people. I enjoy being involved with people. I think what's been good for me, and and uh, maybe it's why I came to both of these two, two careers, is that... Um, I can have incredible empathy for people. And when I think about anybody who's learning a new technique or struggling with something, I so understand that. Uh, that is not alien to me. So I think I bring that to my teaching is I'm, I'm so confused most of the time that I feel like uh, I can empathize with people. So maybe all that goes together in some way. <laughs> Somehow I doubt that. <laughs> well, when you started out as a professional weaver, you said that you would weave items that you knew would sell, you know, like the dish towels and the table runners and that kind of thing. And then you would take that money and go buy more yarn so that you could make more things to sell. Mm -hmm. And then you also talked about how early on you had to learn how to dye so that you could match your skeins, right? When they, you had that warp, you had to make sure that the next towel was the same color as the previous town. Yeah. So it seems like that you 
you learn through necessity. And that was a strong driving force in your work. Yeah, I was totally um, in a situation where uh, my my ex, well, he's my ex now, but at the time uh, he was a woodworker and I was a weaver. Mm -hmm. And well, we, we both still are woodworkers and weavers, but we were totally trying to support ourselves. And as our children came along, our children on, on craft work and that anybody who's done that knows this, that is difficult. So each thing I sold just allowed me to make the next thing. That is really true. Um, I, I did have to make things I knew would sell. I, I really didn't feel like at the time I had a lot of room for just, oh, I think I'll make one of these and these. But I had a line and I, and I knew that they would sell. But within that line, I had a huge amount of, of creative flexibility. So I think um, my dye work is what kept me doing it and, and kept me, it, I entertained myself as I wove. <laughs> like that. Well, you have this huge following online, uh, the Blazing Shuttles folks, and your approach to social media is almost like a textbook for how to do it, how to set it up, how to market yourself. Um, so how did you know? Because you always stay connected to your audience. I mean, if, if you're on your website or on you know the Facebook, you see how you're talking to people and they're telling you things and showing you what they made. How did you know that was the wave of the future? Because you started this way back when you know internet was just getting started, right? I actually looked that up. I was um, I joined Facebook the year after it went you know, it, it became a thing. It became available to the, to the, to the public. And uh, a friend of mine got me started on it, but um, it was so perfectly um, obvious to me that it gave me an opportunity to, to have, to contact and be in touch with a huge number of people, as opposed to the few that I ran into at a craft show or that happened to see my work in a gallery. It, it, it just opened doors that were mind boggling to me. Um, I think it is true that I use it in a way that I think is really effective. And I, and I keep talking with other people about, come on, come on, you can do this, you can do this. <laughs> but it does take uh, a lot of attention. I'm really responsive. If, if, you know, the thing about Facebook is if anybody uses your name and tags you, it doesn't matter where they are or who they are, you see it. Mm -hmm. And uh, it could be someone in, in New Zealand that I've never met, but if they mention me, I know it. And I immediately respond if, if I am able to, in some way, at least a thumbs up, if not a full, you know, response of some sort, but, um, I love the community it builds, mm -hmm. and uh, that's you, that's how I do it. It's nice to belong to a group, and um, I love seeing what people make, and you know their comments, and you know it gives me ideas what I'm going to do next. It's it's just a wonderful uh, site to participate in. So. Oh, it it is. It's just been beyond my wildest dreams. You know the 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 huge community, and. Uh, you know, I love being supportive, being supported and being supportive. It's really a, a give and take in a huge way. You know, I, I, I see people making things I never would have thought to make with my materials, but I'm just blown away by the skills they bring to it and the creative process they bring that wasn't mine. It was theirs. And when I see whatever they do, I'm just so happy that I, I feel like in some small way I collaborated with them on that. <laughs> well, I have to say, I, I have real mixed feelings about when we did the TAL exchange, one of the first, I think it was the first TAL exchange, there were rumors flying around that blazing shuttles um, warps were going to be made into TALs. And I, if it had been in live person, I think there would have been like fighting <laughs> to get their hands on those towels. And it was just so amazing to see that. But to be honest, I was like, oh my gosh, you're going to use those beautiful warps for a towel? But then 
I thought, oh, I don't know. It'd be kind of a nice towel to have. You know, I, I, I didn't understand, even though I was doing uh, household linens, I was doing mats and runners and blankets and one thing and another. I actually had never made a towel. I had never made a towel because it's sort of a one-off. And I was weaving huge fabric that then I was cutting up or leaving huge. And uh, so someone contacted me and asked for a warp to weave towels with. And I literally had to go online and look up how wide is a towel? What kind of yarn do you use? How do you set it? And, and then I, I start and I found out that towels are to weavers sort of as mugs are to potters. You know, it's it's a smallish project that you can afford to experiment on and give as gifts or save or sell at a price that's affordable. Um, I, towels are just fabulous. Oh, they are, they are. Um, so we're gonna talk, we're gonna shift gears here a little bit. We're gonna talk about your studio, which is just gorgeous. And those of you who went on the tour this past summer at Convergence, you saw these um, this beautiful place. It's just a place to create. You just get the feeling that you can do wonderful things when you go there. So how does this impact you? I mean, was this something you set out to do? If I want a special place I can create, or are you one of those people that you can create anywhere? Oh, I think everywhere I go, I, I sort of um, try to, I try to reflect the playfulness that I, I think is, is a really large part of who I am. You know, I, I, I like to see humor in pretty much everything. I think I'm hilarious. I mean, I have no idea what anybody else thinks, but I tend to think I'm hilarious. Um, but I, I love just a playful attitude and atmosphere. And so the creativity, the my gardens, which really can't see my gardens too much here, but I've got one garden that I call the Biltmore Estate Garden because I took on way more than I can keep up comfortably. But um, I love it. It just makes me happy when I open the door in the morning and I step outside, it, my, you know, surrounding just, just lifts me up. It's beautiful. I love these images. My my actually my boyfriend uh, painted those um, those murals and oh, really? uh, oh they're huge if you can see the uh, that's the on the uh, left hand picture there those windows are actually uh, this door size mm -hmm. they're uh, they're sliding glass door replacement panels that's the size of those so you can imagine how big those poppies are well it's a welcome a welcoming sight when when you go to your website, I mean, to your uh, studio and to see those smiling out at you, <laughs> they're wonderful. Oh, thank you. I love them. Well, let me check. I'm going to jump back to the Blazing Shuttles Facebook um, page that you have. One thing I, as we were talking about is how you like to showcase others' works um, on your on your Facebook page. And I was curious that um, you could easily just say, you know, these are my works and here's my warps and this is what's for sale. And I and I know that by showing what people make from your warps, it's also a good way to promote your warps, but it doesn't feel that way. It really feels like you're kind of like a cheerleader um, that you really want to support the people making things. Oh, I'm telling you, that's the best part. It is just I get so excited when I see what people are doing. And I'm also excited when people are like, okay, I haven't bought a work from you, or I have six of them and I don't know what to do with them. You know, all of the steps, the, everything, the process, the creativity, the, the designing, it's all so exciting. And um, being able to in any way sponsor that or just cheer people on, you know, there are people out there who basically need no help from me at all, other than they just started with my materials and then they took off running and I'm floored with what people bring. So yeah, it's a, it's a community. I will say the Blazing Shuttles Chatter Facebook page is actually the community page. Mm -hmm. My page is just where I show cat videos and I do Wordle, you know, but um, so if anybody wants to be involved with the Blazing Shuttles Chatter page, it is a focus page on um, using, you know, the dyed warps. 
Um, and if you want in, please answer the question because it's amazing how nobody wants to answer the question and we won't let you in if you don't. But um, anyway, it's just this community of people that are so supportive of each other. And it's not just me, like anybody who can come to this page and go, oh gosh, I got this, you know, tend to mercerized warp and I just don't know what to do with it. And 10 people will jump up and say, well, this is what I did with mine, or this is how I said it, or here's the draft I used, or hmm, have you thought about doing this with it? Um, it's just, I don't even have to step in and say anything because the community supports each other and it's, it's, it's zero drama. It's the, it's one of the few pages I've had. There's almost 4,000 members and there is no drama. It is 100% positive and supportive and in celebrate celebrative well and it's such a um a generous bunch yes yes i mean yes. weavers are generous people this but. uh picture on the left is uh patricia um uh rush uh oh gosh patricia rushmore and oh, okay. uh, she is that i just love that piece and the piece on the right is the warp of <coughs> um, one of the students that class i just taught in um Texas, the contemporary hand weavers of Texas. So that was a work from a workshop that, that she put on. That was just a couple of weeks ago, right? Oh, it just happened. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I could spend the whole hour talking with you about color because in my book, you're the color queen, you know, color. So I would assume that you were born with this magic gift of understanding color and knowing how to use it and everything. Is that true? Or do you feel like you really had to work at it and kind of hone your skill to be this good at color? I will definitely say I've gotten a better eye for it than I had. But I, I also believe that some people are born with just an ear for music. You know, they hear, a, they hear it and they know it and they can reproduce it and or or maybe they weren't born with it, but they take to it really quickly. And that's not, I love music, but I am not that person. But what I am is I think it's a similar thing, but it's with color. I, and I, I see color and I understand it and I can analyze it. Uh, technically, I can look at a color and reproduce it pretty mm -hmm. well with my dyes. Um, but I also, I also, and very clear on the colors that I love in terms of how they work together. Um, so yeah, I, I think I've gotten more and more into the complexity um, and less just liking those out and out, um, oh, you know, primaries or, or, you know, dual tones that are so easy. But working my way into some of the more subtle colors has definitely come with a little age and experience. Well, when did you first start dyeing? When, well, when I was in the weaving program in the late 70s, my okay. teacher uh, for that program for two and a half years, lucky me, was Catherine Ellis. And she's just the, a goddess as far as I'm concerned. Um, she's, she's really creative, but she's got what she has that, that is so... Uh, wonderful too. She's got a very technical brain in terms of being able to stay on task and focused. Uh, this is not, that is not one of my, um, one of my traits, but so I learned a lot from her in terms of the, um, the, the technical end of how dyes work, but what has made it mine is just playing. I really, really play. And so when I teach a dye class, I give enough information that I hope people can um, understand the, the technical things that make it color fast and a few other things, but mainly it's just, okay, now let's play. Now let's play. Where, where are we going with this? Well, what do you think has changed since the 70s as far as color or dyeing, either for you personally or just for the industry? Well, I think one of the major things is back in back then in the day, back mm -hmm. in the day, you know, 43, 44 years ago. When you were um, 10. <laughs> yeah, 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 right. Yeah. Well, all of the any dye book you picked up, it was a chemistry book. 
there was no interesting dye. You were not going to pick up a dye book that you looked at. Wow, that's cool. I want to do that. You would pick it up and go, okay, now I have to learn everything there is about milliliters and grams. And (laughs) oh man, I hated that. I just hated that. And so as soon as I could move on, as soon as I understood it well enough to take it my own direction, it it just uh, changed my life. Huh, okay. Now, did you do that on your own or was that I after you worked pretty with pretty much on my own? Or? Pretty much, on, no, pretty much on my own because, you know, I've just been doing this for so long and uh-huh. I love color so much. And I knew early, from early on that if I had to do everything in which I did have to measure out grams and liters and and the the you know the water temperature has to be this exact same thing and all that I, I just wouldn't do it you know I just wasn't gonna it just wasn't gonna be fun and ultimately if it's not fun I don't enjoy it and if yeah. I don't enjoy it I'm not gonna do it so I know there are people out there that are like total chemists and they love that not your thing I mean. <laughs> Well, I have to say, I you are by far one of the hardest working people I know. I mean, you're always putting out new warps and new colorways and, you know, keeping people informed. So how do you stay, I mean, excited and creative? Do you ever get burned out and just think, if I have to die another skein, I'm going to just jump off a bridge or something? Uh, no, there are days I'd like to just like yesterday it was raining. Okay. Uh, and it was like, oh, I just like to snuggle in all day and not do anything, but that was not going to happen. Uh, so I just had to do it. And so if it's a job and, and it is your income, mm-hmm. then whether you want to snuggle that day or not, you know, you, you have to do what you have to do. Um, but I will say, I think I, I just love it. You know, I enjoy it so much that I've been able to um, to just keep moving through it. And, and I do, even though I, I have evolved slowly because I mean, literally anything you've been doing for 40 something years, you know, you, you can get, you can, you can end up with a whole lot of evolution at a snail pace because you've just done it so long. Uh, but it's, it's just been exciting. And um, I think once again, bringing in, all of the the people that I'm involved with. Mm-hmm. Uh, if I were totally in my shop doing this alone and sending it out to sell through a gallery in uh, you know Nebraska, uh, I I probably would not have the energy I have to keep going. Well, I want to go back, Mandy, if you don't mind, if we can go back to the previous image because I meant to talk about this and I got off on another topic, but. Um, this piece on the right now is this something new that you're doing to sell or is this one of those things you're doing for you both really i had a a group in uh, cincinnati asked me Mm -hmm. to come teach a a basically a surface design class that that was uh it was on commercial fabric and it was uh resist dying and dying and over dying and discharging and uh, i had done a little enough that i had attracted their attention but not enough that I thought, oh, I can go teach that. Well, I mean, I thought I could until it was actually within several months of it. And then I went, you know, maybe I should spend a little more time. I had so much fun. I was just going crazy in my dye kitchen. And every day I was just like, oh, I can't wait to open up this piece that I had clamped and dyed the day before. This particular piece on the right was, it's actually one of the last pieces I did, Uh, but it's all, um, it's clamped and resisted with three washers. It's all folded up. And then I have three washers, you know, like, like, you know, hardware washers. And uh, I clamped them. And when I opened it up, this is what I got. And I got to tell you, I was just as surprised as anybody else who would have been standing there. But um, I've just loved it. So this is something I would like to spend a lot more time on. And especially the ones that go from here on into, this was a one, one step die. Mm-hmm. But what I've been doing is dying and then over dying and then discharging and then over dying so that there's more layers working up. Uh, so this is one of the simple pieces, but I, I just didn't just, oh, I want to do more of this. 
So <clears throat> did you go find a book on how to do this? Or are you one of those people that just kind of no, I just started doing it. Well, I've been dying for so long. I knew right. how to die. It was just like, okay, now what happens if you do this? What happens <laughs> if you do that? And I think that is so important to not only who I am, but who I am as a teacher is I really want people to go. And I'm never saying what this is isn't enough or what this is isn't good. I'm, but I do, am saying, wow, okay, look, what if now you did this or now you took this step or, oh, if you change this, <clears throat> you know, uh, if you layered another color or if you reset this or if you uh, re-threaded some of your threads and changed your, your block pattern right in the middle of the project. Um, you know, I, I, I love that what if. So, mm -hmm. um, so that's what I spend a lot of time with myself and, and when I'm teaching, I'm, it's always, what if. I like that. I like that. I have to admit, I've been in your class and you were, you were great. I mean, I was clueless, like a lot of people in the class, we didn't know what we were doing and you were great about go for it, try it. You know, <laughs> I didn't feel like it was going to be like, what are you doing? What are you doing? <laughs> Oh, no, I, I'm as excited as my students are with every project, whether it's weaving or dying. I'm standing there going, oh, this is so exciting. This is so exciting. And, you know, they they literally are not more excited than I am. <laughs> well, now I'm going to do the, the 10 questions. All right. One word or two or three word answers. Okay. Or if we talk more about it, that's fine, too. All right. OK, what is your favorite color? Oh, you know what? It's. I'm right now at a place where it's all about combos. It's not about a color. It's about which colors I am enjoying working with together. And I will say the thing that really got me started on that was when I first tried um, uh, uh, Southwest colors and, you know, working with warm and cool rust and turquoise, mm -hmm. you know, really just playing with the colors that, 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 that play off against each other. All right. Um, if I wasn't, a, I want you to answer this. If I wasn't a fiber artist, I would be. I would be a, I would be a professional storyteller. Really? Mm -hmm. I think I that would be good. I would love that. I would yeah. love that. Yeah, I could do that. Well, I mean, I'd have to work at it, but you know, sooner or later I could do it. You, you know, the National Storytelling Association has a meeting just in up the road in Tennessee. I know, I know. And I've never been able to get to that, but I, I would love to. I just go love, move in, move oh, in. I think that would be fun. Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, the most important tool in my studio is? My warping reel. I thought you'd say that. Yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't do this without a full, I mean, it's, I've got a six foot long wide, well wide, because it's horizontal warping reel. And I, I and my helpers wind from 20 cones at once. And well, if we have that many, if we have fewer, we work from fewer, but it's, I, I just couldn't do this otherwise. It's, it's really a fabulous tool. And it's the well, same one I've been using since I was a student back in the seventies. It is a thing to behold. When I walked in and saw that thing, it was like, oh my gosh, yeah, it's, I've it's never seen anything of, so big. Just, oh, it's, it's just the best. <laughs> um, if you were a curator of an exhibit, what would be in the exhibit, either a person or a type of art or whatever? If I were going to curate a show, I would want three people in it. Well, I mean, I might want dozens, but if I can only have three, I would want Hetty Lyles, Esther Budd, and Patty Lamb. And if you don't know those people, you should, because they are creative. They are incredible fiber artists in terms of the complexity, their, their use of color, their, the, and their generous natures. They're just such generous people. So I, that's who I'd want. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> Shout out to those guys. Um, the best thing about teaching is just sharing passion sharing fiber passion and watching. I love while I'm talking about something that it sounds totally insane because I'm trying, I'm explaining it in a way they've never maybe perhaps thought of before when I just see those little light bulbs going off like, oh, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. oh, no, I didn't get that. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, I did. <laughs> 
And not only that, but here's how I can use it in the way that works for me. Right. Not just, and now I'm going to copy what she does, but ooh, that really makes sense because if I did that, I would do it in this way. And I love that. All right. The other side, which is what is the worst thing about teaching? Organizing and prep work. I, I'm just, that is just not the thing that I, I enjoy. So I, I, I have to do it, but uh, I'm, I'm not, it's, I'm not the best, I'm not the best organizer or prepper. Um, your best aha moment. Well, I think the number one has to be when it dawned on me that Facebook was going to save literally saved me. I had uh, just had major back surgery where I had my back rebuilt, bone grafts, titanium, everything. I had just uh, lost my life partner and I just had, believe it or not, a torn uh, torn retina and a detached retina. So I had oh my gosh. all these things happen to me like within a year or so. And I was had no idea how I was going to survive all this. And um, then one day I realized the merits of what I could do with Facebook and, and it was going to change my life and it did. So I would say my biggest aha moment was, was that. All right. The one thing you wish I would ask you. Oh gosh, let's see. I wish you would ask me about my helpers. Catherine. Tell us about your helpers. Oh, let me tell you about my helpers. Oh my gosh. So I have got Joe Cordell, who has been with me for many, many, many years, 10, 12 years. I don't even know. We quit keeping track. And he is fabulous. He has wound warps. He has boiled out. He has scoured. He he will look up and go, oh my God, the, all of the gutters on your shop are totally clogged. I'm going to take care of that. He is like the best. Okay. And right now I also, and he also went through the same program I went through. Also, Grace Ingle is working with me currently, and she just graduated a few years ago. She is fabulous. She is currently my warp winder and uh, well, and many other things, but she is the best. So, and I've just had so many, I've had helpers from the beginning. So it's just like, there's never been a time when I didn't have somebody that was really instrumental in helping me move to where I need to get to. So when you said they're from the same program, you're talking about Haywood? Yeah, yeah, the professional crafts program. So I graduated in 80, Joe graduated around 2000, and Grace graduated, oh, maybe in 21, 22. So yeah, 21, I think. Yeah, so how the fortunate whole, that you're that close to each other. Oh, I mean, right across the road. It's great for them and great for you. It's wonderful. Oh, and I've had a dozen people from that program work for me over the years. Huh? It's it's really great for someone who doesn't first of all maybe want to start their own business or second of all want to but just haven't gotten it together yet. Then it's really <laughs> nice for them to get the experience uh, and make a few bucks, you know, working with a a fiber artist who's been doing it for a long time. You may start getting calls. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, where are we on the list? Oh, um, if I was the host, if you were the host of Textiles and Tea, who would you interview? It doesn't matter if they've even been on here before. Who would you want to interview? Well, you know, I would want to interview, and I think you should. Uh, his name is Rod Sober. Okay. And you may not know him because he just started weaving around the time, I think, now I could be wrong, but I believe he started weaving around the time of the pandemic. The reason I think he's incredible is he, what he was doing before was he worked, uh, well, and still does on, for Broadway. He does clothing. He does, uh, he's a dresser. He works with wardrobe. He, like, you can't name somebody who's been on Broadway that he doesn't know personally, but he came to weaving. He had to have a job because Broadway was shut down. So he taught himself to weave. He has this huge, this incredible touch for fabric and eye and, um, I just am in awe of him. I think he is, and 
he's such a new weaver that he comes with a whole perspective that us old timers don't have anymore. I just, anyway, I highly recommend him. Rod Silver. So, Sover, S-O-V-A-R. He's in so, New York. He's all right. He's taking care of Broadway. We'll have to ask him. Do it. All he can do is say no, right? That's true. We'll but see. I'll say, you know, Catherine Weber was on there. And then he'll go, oh, oh well, then I got to be on here, right? <laughs> he is great. He's a lovely person. Oh, good. We'll have to do that. Yeah. Andy, did you get that? I hope so. <laughs> um, so one of the things that um, I was thinking about earlier, and I, I didn't ask you this on the questions, but I'm going to ask you now, is that I had read that you said one of the reasons why your um, your warps work so well together is the use of cool and warm colors. Can you talk some more about that? Yeah, I will just, I will for a minute. Uh, when people say which warps go to, oh, and you will see all these warps behind me. Uh, I'm sitting in my office and there's a bookcase back there and <laughs> I couldn't go from my shop because my shop doesn't have a good connection. So I just brought some shop up here. But when people ask what warps should I put together? The answer is pretty much any of them. They all work together. I never think about using a single warp. I always always mix warps in my own warp and, and I encourage other people to I think they go together because I dye from seven colors that's uh, that's seven dyes is all I use I use warm and cool red warm and cool blue yellow and then two um, um a warm a warm and a cool neutral the thing about the warm and the cool is first of all I love <laughs> warps that have warm and cool in them because I think they're dynamic um, and and they're they're more interesting to me than something that's all cool or all warm. Um, but in the dye work, the complex colors are created when you start mixing warm and cool dyes mm -hmm. to create a color. So there's just so much. That's that's the first thing I try to talk with people about in a dye class is okay. We're going to start mixing mixing dyes here. And how you're going to get the complex colors is by mixing the warm versions and with the cool versions, because otherwise you're going to get a jewel tone, which is lovely, but it's not complex. Oh, okay. Okay. Hmm. I should take your class. <laughs> I, did it. I did. I did. <laughs> it was a long time ago and you were much younger then. Yeah, I was. I've slept since then. Um, everybody's asking. Um, it's S O V A R, right? On yes. Rod. Yes, Sover. Okay. S O V A R R O D D. Or O two Ds. All right. Yes, and his. Uh, I think somebody posted it a minute ago. Yeah. I think his. It's Main Street. Um, I think it's his business, MainStreet.com right. or something. Yeah. All right. If some if somebody's got an in with Rod, contact me. <laughs> we want to get him on here. He's just got such an interesting background. It's not just weaving, it's more than weaving, but it all has to do with fiber. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so what's next for you? Oh, well, I am slowing way down on how much I'm traveling to teach. Uh, you right, are. Yeah, I am. Right before COVID, I, I was doing 14, 16 classes a year. I, I mean, it was on airplanes or in my car, mostly on airplanes all the time. And the thing that got canceled that I literally was about to get on a plane heading to Singapore. And uh, I was gonna be there for weeks and I, I, I literally had to cancel it because it was during that March shutdown, you know? Right. Um, but anyway, so um, I am cutting way back. What I've decided is I, I love to teach, but I want to not be on the road or in the air all the time. So what I'm going to do in the future is I'm going to teach a few classes a year at places I really want to go visit and see more than the airport and the facility at which I'm teaching. So I think in the contract from now on, it's going to have tour day. Okay, what what can you offer me in terms of a tour of your beautiful area? Because uh, that's how I'm going to decide where to teach from now on. <laughs> that is so smart. What a great idea. And if anybody in Hawaii is watching this, 
<laughs> I have never been to Hawaii. Hey, that contingency <laughs> out there is a hoot and a half. When they come to Convergence, it's so funny. I'm sure they're watching. They will be contacting you. They are well, a great bunch. I think I need to go with you to carry your luggage. So. I, I'm going to need somebody. There I'm you go. Sure there you go. That. I can be a gopher. I'm good. a good gopher. All right, Hawaii. I know one of you's watching, so <laughs> contact her. All right, well, let's answer some questions. How's that? You no, got a boatload. We may not get to them all. Oh, here we go. <clears throat> Most of these are going to be praise, so. Uh, thank you for starting me on my weaving journey. That's from Karen Fink. Hi, Karen. Oh, that is And funny. then May Chester saying hi. Pam Howard. Hi, Pam. And how do you come up with the names for your dyed warps? That's from Judy oh. Leatherberry. <laughs> oh, my gosh. No, seriously. If you come to visit me, I will make you dye a, a name a warp before you leave. I, you, you won't, I won't let you leave until you name a warp. And I'm, you know... <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, Joe, it's your turn to name warps. And he's like, no, I can't no. name warp. <laughs> and the thing is, sometimes uh, we'll think of a name and we'll go, mm, we might have used that before. Oh, we're going to use it again. So, <laughs> you know, but we, we do try to come up with fun names. Oh, that's funny. Can't leave until you name a warp. <laughs> um, Gail Troy says hi. She's in Shipman. Oh, good. Okay. Why is my computer? Here we go. Wake up, computer. Um, hey, Catherine, see you at MAFA in two days. That's from Ruth. <laughs> you are going to be in uh, MAFA, right? I'm, be on the airplane in less than, an, less than 24 hours from now. So you're going to be teaching up at uh, MAFA? I'll be, yeah, I'll be doing um, a, a weaving class. And then again in July uh, at News, New England. Weaving. Oh, are you doing News? Yeah. And I won't, I have never done, I've never been there before. So, so there be, you go. Is there a tour day? I do Tell you the truth, I'm not thinking about it yet. I'm thinking about Mama. <laughs> um, Kevin, I'm not sure what you're asking. So if you'll follow up on your question, that would help. Um, are your workshops online or in person or both? Yeah, are you doing online? You are uh, some, well, are you? I don't do any what I call classes, but I do have some two-hour presentations. Oh, okay. Which I go step-by-step step through my process. I've got a weaving uh, one that I think is, um, I, I actually had a group order warps from me so that they could watch the two-hour thing, then do the project, and then, you know, get back in touch with me to, to talk about how it went. So, so I'm not, I'm not trying to teach in person, well, you know, in Zoom in person, but uh, I do have a few things that I have on my website, which is blazingshuttles.com, um, that are pretty instructive. Um, Muriel, I think that's her name, says so she's curious why the warps are 4.5 yards long. It's not long enough for two scarves. <laughs> well, there are 4.5, 7.5, 10.5, 13.5. And the reason is because it's three and a half yards around my warping reel and then another yard and a half to balance it. <clears throat> okay, so so because of the way the warping mill works, uh, you, know, you don't start and stop at the same place because it's horizontal. So everything I wind is, is a multiple of three plus a yard and a half. And I'm happy to do longer warps than 10 and a half is my normal quit, although sometimes I do 13 and a half. But if anybody wants anything quite a bit longer, uh, just contact me and we'll talk about it. Mary Holm wants to know, can we see the warping wheel? Mary, I'm sorry, she's not in her studio. Wish. I know, I'm sorry. I should have got a picture of it because it is a thing to behold. Oh, and watching <laughs> all the threads go from the floor all the way up to the ceiling, go through the eye hooks and then back down is just, it, it's its like an amusement ride. You know, it's funny. I <clears throat> inherited a box of weaving stuff and I'm sure other people have been through that too, either themselves or the guild. And I had a board with eye hooks in it. I had no idea. When I went to your studio, I was like, oh. that. <laughs> Well, I am also teaching in my um, studio um, a few classes a year. And the nice thing about taking a weaving or dyeing workshop in my studio is you literally get to see my entire process, mm. not just the abbreviated version that we do when I'm traveling. 
Now, do you teach the dyeing in your studio or both dyeing and weaving? Both. I mean, it's either one or the other. It's not okay. like a class where you do both, but uh, it's on my website, blazingshuttles.com <laughs> under teaching. And at this point, you know what I said? My very least favorite part was the organizing and the uh, prep. Well, I just decided from now on, anything that happens in my workshop, any classes are going to be self-organized. So I'll take up to five people and one person's a point person and they gather up four of their friends and then they talk with me about what they want to learn and they come as a group. So I'm not going to do any more organizing. If you want to come, you bring the, you put together your friends and contact me and then we'll make it happen. I think that's a great idea. It's worked great so far. Yeah. And the nice thing is then five people come together that are already buddies. And so it's like a retreat. You know, there's some wonderful places to stay here in the mountains and they just sit out on their porch and eat crackers and drink wine in the evening. And if I'm lucky, I get invited over. And uh, it's way better than having a bunch of strangers come that get to know each other, but don't come with a already bond, you know, without mm -hmm. the, this is, this is just working out great. And I'm, I'm really loving working with people that are already friends. Well, I, we've, our people are asking about who were the three artists that you mentioned. And oh, did I going to have when I curate? Yes. Okay, here they are. Uh -huh. and Hedy Lyles, H E D Y L L Y L E S, Hedy Lyles, Esther Budd, B U D D, and Patty Lamb, P A T T I E lamb and they're they don't probably have never met they they're from different parts of the country they're all friends of mine uh on the um you know through the chatter group and they're what i call blazers they're my blazers <laughs> you know i have an entire lexicon of of uh technical of uh, terms that uh um, yeah like that I use dying in Weber world. Yeah, yeah. That. Well, we also talk about when you you have the mother warp, but when you split off small pieces, you have warplets. warplets. So you know, there's there's just all kinds of things that you, you that we <laughs> that we play with language play. But uh, the three of them, they just feel to me like they do such the different enough work that it would be interesting, but similar enough that that you just be mesmerized by the three of them. Well, this is a good question. I, I'm, I've been reading this over. It's like, which color combination is the hardest to make when you're making? Oh, your the real neutrals. The more neutral it is, the harder. Is you know, it? it? Oh, like it's easy to hit. You know, if it's a, if it's just a blue or a, or a red, or just slightly off. You know, like a, oh, a um, forest green or a, you know, I mean. It, all of those are easy, but what's really hard is something that's borderline, sort of a, a blushy almond, you know, or, or oh, those, those really, really neutrals are hard because it's hard to put in so little of something because each, it has a whole <laughs> bunch of colors, but a tiny bit of each. And if you put in too much red, it just turns pink. Mm -hmm put in too much blue, it just turns blue. And it's like, I just wanted enough to knock the edge off of the orange. You know, it was a little too orangey. So I put in a little blue and well, now it's totally wrong. But anyway, yeah, the, the closer it is to neutral, the harder it is to nail for me. Um, Carol Ventura wants to know what kind of uh, dyes do you use? I use Procyon uh, fiber. Uh, it's called Fiber Reactive MX and they're Procyon. They're they're called cold water dyes, but it's not really cold. I mean, it's it's what you don't have to do is simmer it or boil it like you mm -hmm. do with uh, wool because I'm totally working with plant based fibers. So uh, you just need water out of your spigot and uh, turquoise and black. One it hot, the other ones don't. There's a lot of little tricks, but uh, yeah. Somebody wants you to come to Alaska. I might. I've never been to Alaska. There you go, Laurel. <laughs> Come up with a tour day. <laughs> Somebody else wants to know if you'll do um, Santa Fe. I'll do Santa Fe. <laughs> She says, come to Santa Fe and we'll show you the sites and tour you around the city. Well, I got oh, San that's Pamela. Hi, Pamela. San Antonio is talking with me right now. So there you go. Because I was just in Texas, you know, so the, that's true. You know, that's the true. Texans are sort of, um, I had so much fun. What a lovely group of people.
They are a cool bunch. They are very oh, they're cool great. Yeah. They do great stuff down there. Yeah, yeah. Really. Um, what is your best or favorite fiber for color fastness? Have you dyed linen or well, no? They're all. I mean, the plant fibers are all color fast, but I will say some just take with more lusciousness. Mm -hmm. Okay, like the more it's been manipulated, the deeper it dyes. So, oh, like, really? Oh, yeah. Like tinsel which is a, you know, a more, you know, ecological basic, it's basically a rayon, but it's, mm -hmm. it's the new age. So it's more ecological and everything, but it's, it's, it's just totally broken down. It's plant fiber that's been extruded. It's been broken down to a fluid and extruded any kind of rayon or tinsel or bamboo, all of those, they die so beautifully. And then Mercerized cotton dyes beautifully because it's also been sort of, uh, you know, manipulated. And the things that are the hardest to dye and get really deep, luscious colors are the unmercerized cotton because really the only thing that's happened to it is it's been harvested and maybe or maybe not cleaned, maybe or maybe not uh, combed and carded, but one way or the other, it's been spun. Um, but it's it's the hardest to get mm. deep colors. It's still fighting. It's still it's it's still putting up a fight. It's the others have given fight. up. They're just like, oh, go ahead, die me. I don't care. A double dog dare you. Yeah. Mm. Uh, oh, Melanie wants to know if you'll put a picture of the warping mill on your blazing shuttles page. I've I'll put started it on the chatter something. page. No, it's okay. I will. I'll put it on the chatter page. Thank and you. Everybody that's on here, please feel free, feel free to join us on Blazing Shuttles Chatter. But answer the question. You wouldn't believe how hard me and my, because I've got several men's people, it, it just says, do you understand this is Blazing Shuttles and it's about Blazing Shuttles? It's all you have to do is say yes. But people won't do it. So we're like, eh, you're not in. <laughs> uh, it's a pretty intrusive question, you know. I mean, it's really not that hard, but, you know. All right. Hetty Lyles. Hetty, I've heard on? that we asked you. I just found out we asked Hetty uh -huh. to be on Textiles and Tea. And she well, said, did she turn you down? Yes. Oh. No well, pressure, Hetty. Well, she may not even want to be in the uh, exhibition that I'm going to curate. I don't know. <laughs> she says she's too much of an introvert. But what do you think? It's like just sitting in a room talking to me, right? Well, you know what? It is true. You you make it easy. But there are people who she she's pretty. I can see she's a little quiet. But oh, my gosh, her work is so oh, good. Actually, to tell you the truth, I could sit here and name three dozen people that I am amazed by. Every time I see anything of theirs, I'm just amazed. So, um, and some of them are such quiet little people. Ann Baker, okay, Ann Baker, if you're watching, she's come and taken classes in my shop and she's really pretty quiet, but her work is explosive. You know, I love these people. I love to be shocked. Well, Hetty, not to make you feel bad, you're not the first person that said, oh my God, I can't go in there and do that. So, but we would love to have you and we'll talk, Hetty, we'll talk. <laughs> she said that you're her favorite teacher. I don't know if I said that or not. Well, so. Hetty, I'm sorry I brought you up if uh, if I've- uh, No pressure, no pressure. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, Dennett Solgrove wants to know how easy is linen to dye? Um, no, it's actually, I really have thought that it was going to fight me because sometimes it's so hard and sometimes <clears throat> spun so tightly. Yeah. I've got to say, I've had really, really good experience with, uh, with linen. Do you and, use a paddle? Uh, you mean when I wind it? Yeah. Use a paddle? Yeah. When it's wound. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I don't do anything without, if I don't have, if I don't have a multiple cones, I don't. I don't fool with it. If I have one cone or something, forget it. It's I'll never use it. Oh, you know what I'll do is I'll turn it into a skein. And oh, okay. yeah, yeah, but not a warp. Well, I'm trying to run through these, but we're not going to get through them all. I'm sorry. And Diane Totten says, you know, thank you for all your help with social media, dyeing the beautiful skeins and your generosity of information. Oh, well, she's great. She, yeah. She's a lot of fun. All right. Um, Michaela, sorry, we're not going to get to yours and a bunch of other people. But could they, if they really want answers, can they email you and say, hey, blah, blah, well, blah, Keep blah, in blah. mind, I am leaving in less than 24 hours from MAPA. So but when you get back. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead and, you know, get in touch with me uh, and I will try to, you know, hopefully, you know, it won't be too long, but I will try to um, 
I, I do try to be responsive. You're pretty good at it. <laughs> well, thank you so much for being on here today. I can't believe our hour is gone. It's been wonderful talking to you, Catherine. Well, you've just been great. And thank you so much for having me. And uh, I hope I run into every single one of you out there at some point somewhere. Oh, I'm sure you will. You're going to see a bunch this weekend. They're all saying, see you in a couple of days. See you in a couple of days. Uh, again, I want to thank you all for watching. If you want to know more about Catherine Weber, go to her website, blazingshuttles.com. It's an amazing website. And you can learn more about um, if you want to set up a class. Uh, you can see where she's teaching, all those kinds of good things. But contact her uh, if you have some questions that we didn't get to today. And I'm sorry we didn't get to all of them. Um, we had a bunch. I want to thank our um, sponsor, which was the Georgia Fans of Blazing Shuttles. And I'm hoping I get all these names down because I, I wrote it down. They are um, uh, Katie Arnold, uh, Kathy Ralston, um, Lee Skaronsky, and I'm forgetting the last person. I'm so sorry. I'll think of it before I hand I go today. But thank you guys for doing this. The Georgia fans of Blazing Chettles. See, even a bunch of people can get together and sponsor a textiles and tea. So if you think of it, you want to do that, let me know. Um, we uh, you can also do it if you're a business or a guild or whatever, if you want to sponsor. If you do, go to the website at wespendie.org and you can sign up to sponsor an episode of um, Textiles and Tea. Oh, here's last night, Cynthia Creech. Cynthia, I apologize. Thank you so much for uh, sponsoring Textiles and Tea today. Sorry, Mandy. <laughs> Sending her everywhere. Yeah, you know what's coming up? The 2023 Spinning and Weaving Week celebration. We've got our studio tours set up. These are our studio tours. Uh, <clears throat> if you want to check out some of these folks and see um, their work and get interested in them. The Gnome School, I'm excited to see them. They took an old um, school and turned it into an art center. Some of these artists you've seen when they were on Textiles and Tea, we're very excited about it. You can start signing up in July and you can see all of these uh, artist tours. But we also have Art Sparks. If you wanna take a class online, there's everything from a lecture of an hour or so or um, how to. So check those out also. Uh, Thread Talks, which is the HTA TED Talks. Uh, we're gonna be having people come in and talk about what they're passionate about. We've got Marketplace Live. If you wanna look at some items that you might wanna buy, it's a good chance to see those live or even talk to the owners and discuss the, the yarn. So if you haven't been able to go shopping uh, yet this year, there's your chance in October. We have the fashion show and I want people to sign up for it. We have fun when we do our fashion show. Um, <clears throat> And registration opens July 2nd. It's October the 2nd through the 8th. It's the first full week of October. Seven days of nonstop fun. Um, and I look forward to seeing you all on there. Uh, July the 5th, I believe, registration opens. You can go online and learn more about that. Um, I want to thank everybody who has sponsored the Textiles and Tea, but also through your um, donating to the Fiber Trust and your membership. Those those monies help programs like Spinning and Weaving Week happen, and we appreciate that. If you've missed any episodes, you can watch those on uh, Facebook Live. You can also watch them on YouTube. They get um, uploaded from, it takes a while to get them uploaded, so they're all not, this one won't be up there for a while, but you should uh, subscribe because when you do, you'll get a notice that says a new face, uh, Facebook, I mean, a new um YouTube has been uploaded. So go on to the YouTube page and look for the HTA YouTube site and sign up. Next week, we have Sarah Gotako. Probably pronounced that wrong. Um, wonderful weaver, uh, interesting person. I think you're going to enjoy her. Please uh, join us next week. Hope you have a great week and happy tea.